Well, good evening. I hope and trust everyone's had a great week so far and a good uh, Fourth of July yesterday. And um, this is Pastor Dean. And uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study this week, we're going to do it all online uh, due to the fact that uh, Fourth of July week, a lot of people taking vacations and uh, we close our daycare down for uh, maintenance on our floors and things like that. Uh, so we didn't have children's ministry tonight. But I felt like uh, I want to finish up the book of Colossians next Wednesday night. So I just felt led to do this Bible study with you online tonight. And we have been studying through the book of Colossians. And it's just been a great study. Uh, I hope and trust you've gotten something out of this as I have. Uh, every now and then I like to go online with this. That way I can um, encourage you. Uh, if, you're, if you're currently not coming to Wednesday night Bible study, if you're not serving in a ministry on Wednesday night, I want to encourage you to come out for about an hour, a little over an hour every Wednesday night. We, uh, we sing, we, we study the Word verse by verse, we do a book study, and we also take prayer requests and we pray uh, each and every Wednesday night. You, um, our church members got uh, uh, prayer bulletins emailed out uh, today, as they do each week. Uh, take, a, take a chance, pray for those people, uh, pray for each and every one. But what I want to do tonight is just go through Colossians chapter 4, Verses 2 through 6. That's our focus tonight, as I want to uh, share this with you uh, this evening. Let's look here. Chapter 3, chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. It says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tonight I want to talk to you about this subject, toward them that are without. We looked at these verses tonight. We want to expound upon these verses, and next week we're going to finish up from verse 7 through 18. But I want to begin with this illustration. It is March the 11th, 1942, a very dark and desperate day in U.S. history. The Pacific theater of World War II was threatening and bleak. One island after another had been buffeted into submission by the Japanese. The enemy was now marching into the Philippines confident and methodical. Surrender was inevitable. The brilliant and bold soldier, Douglas MacArthur, had only three words for his comrades as he stepped into the escape boat destined for Australia. I shall return. Upon arriving nine days later in the port of Adelaide, the 62-year-old military statesman closed his remarks with this sentence, I came through and I shall return. A little over two and a half years later, October the 20th, 1944 to be exact, he stood once again on the Philippine soil after landing safely at Late Island. And this is what he said. This is the voice of freedom. General MacArthur speaking. People of the Philippines, I have returned. MacArthur kept his word. His word was as good as his bond. Regardless of the odds against him, including the pressures and power of enemy strategy, he was bound and determined to make his promise good. There was credibility in that statement. This rare breed of man is almost extinct. Rare indeed are those who keep their word, who have credibility. The prevalence of the problem has caused the coining of a term painfully familiar to us in our era, the credibility gap. To say that something is credible, to say that it is capable of being believed or trustworthy, to refer to a gap, suggest a breach or a reason for doubt. Jurors often have reason to doubt the testimony of a witness on the stand. Parents likewise have reason at times to doubt their children's word and vice versa. Citizens frequently doubt the promises of politicians and the credibility of an employee's word is questioned by the employer. Creditors can no longer believe a debtor's verbal promise to pay and many a spouse has ample reason to doubt the word of his or her partner. There is no such thing as a handshake agreement anymore. Precious few do what they say they will do without a reminder, a warning, or a threat. Unfortunately, this is true even among those who believe in Christ. 
who profess Christ as their Savior, Christians. Many times we have all been guilty of saying one thing and doing another to the detriment of our testimony. We must be motivated to the highest standard, and that is God's standard, of integrity. For words are powerful and actions do speak louder than words. So as we finish up Colossians, we're talking about this subject, this theme, to them that are without and the fact of our word and, and, and the credibility gap, that idea there. So, But we have focused on Colossians and the focus on that number one priority in our lives as believers in Jesus Christ. Because life is busy and we get distracted, it is easy to lose focus on the main thing, and that is Jesus Christ. Many times we inadvertently dethrone Him due to man's opinions and distractions of this world. My challenge to you as we are finishing up this series is to keep our focus upward on the Lord Jesus Christ. May He stay enthroned in your heart. May Christ be so lifted up in your heart that when people see your words, your deeds, your thoughts, and your actions, they see, as Colossians says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So as in these final two chapters of Colossians, Paul is talking about the practical application of the doctrines that he had been teaching. Because if Jesus Christ truly is, if he's truly preeminent in your lives, this is how you should be living according to chapter 3 and 4. This is how you can reflect a proper portrait of Jesus Christ. Because after all, it does little good if Christians declare and defend the truth, but they fail to demonstrate it in their lives. What you believe determines how you behave. Upon a basis of good doctrine rises the structure of practical Christianity. So Paul, in chapter 3, verses 1-7, through seven, uses that illustration of baptism. We are dead in Christ, we're raised in Him. We must live our lives this way. If we're dead to self and alive in Christ, if we have put off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of our mind, put on the new man, if we're allowing the peace of God to rule in our lives and, and, the, and the Word of God to dwell in us, if we're doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if Christ is enthroned in your heart and in your life, the term is preeminent, then we're going to love each other. We'll submit one to another. We'll treat one another fairly in the Lord. There'll be a spirit of thanksgiving within us because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives individually and corporately as a church. As with that parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5, whether it's the Spirit of God or the Word of God, because both are vital, Three evidences are joy, thankfulness, and mutual submission. When these attributes are present in the home, the heart of a believer, if family members are controlled by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, they'll have little trouble getting along with others. The heart of every problem is a problem of the heart, and only God's Spirit and God's Word can change and control the heart. The question is, can others who live with you and who know you, can they detect that you're filled with the Holy Spirit and that of the Word of God. So after showing in detail that Jesus Christ must be supreme in everything, from creation to our actions at home, Paul exhorts the Colossians with respect to two very important matters, prayer and their conduct toward unbelievers. As Paul calls them, those that are without. There in chapter 4 in verse 5, toward those who are outside or those who are without. So how must our conduct be toward them that are outside, those that are without the church? When Christ is preeminent in your life, in my life, in your life, it's going to affect our words and our actions toward unbelievers, giving credibility to our statement of faith in Jesus Christ as we witness for Him. So let's look at some areas here in verses 2 through 4. Number one, as it concerns my prayer life, as it concerns your prayer life, verses 2, 3, and 4, I see verse 2, I must pray faithfully. Verse 2 says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Verse 2 tells us to continue in prayer. Be steadfast in your prayer life. Don't quit praying. Be devoted to prayer. The early church modeled this to us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. They continued one accord in prayer. Too many of us pray occasionally, only when we feel like it or when there's a major crisis. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Be constantly in fellowship with God so that prayer is normal to us as breathing. That's the idea. Because God enjoys answering our prayers, and He either answers with a yes, a no, or a wait. Sometimes He delays the answer in order to increase our faith and devotion and to accomplish our purposes at the right time. As we continue in prayer, our own hearts are prepared, softened for the answer that God will give. 
So we must pray faithfully, as he says there in verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant with it with thanksgiving. But look at verse 3. Pray, pray watchfully. Prayer must be maintained as a regular habit. It should not become just a routine matter. To be accomplished with watchfulness, diligence, persistence. Watch, be awake. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And before his death, Jesus desired to obey the Father and to watch and pray. We must be awake and alert while praying. Nehemiah and his men watched and pray in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. There is no power in dull, listless praying, not from the heart. And we must pray watchfully. We must pray uh, faithfully. But also, thirdly, we must pray thankfully. Thanksgiving, he said in verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. That's an important ingredient in successful praying because Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Uh, sometimes when I pray, I don't know what to say, but I know one thing, I can be thankful. I can open up my heart to God and, and, and start going through a list of things that He has provided for me that I'm thankful for. Uh, and I can uh, appreciate every blessing He's given me. If all we do is ask and never thank God for the gifts, we become selfish. So we must give sincere gratitude toward God. But I see also we must pray purposely. Uh, we must only be vague in general, but pray for specific needs. By doing so, we will know when God answered and we could praise Him for it. I personally keep a prayer journal. And I, and I put on that prayer journal when I requested that prayer request and when God answered that prayer request. And so you're, you're seeing when God answers prayer, and it not only encourages your faith, but it, it motivates you to pray more. See, the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on this earth. Prayer is not telling God what to do or what to give. Prayer is asking God for what He wants to do and give according to His will. Because you always pray in His will. And so in verse 3, Paul asked them to pray for us. He and his fellow workers, fellow laborers, for liberty to proclaim the gospel message. What a prayer. Pray that God would open a door for the word of God. Pray with a desire that the obstacles standing in the way of preaching the gospel would be removed. Pray for the Holy Spirit's help. Paul was not ashamed to ask his friends to pray for him. Even though he was an apostle, he still needed prayer support for the ministry. And we do too. Every ministry, every church needs that prayer support Pray that God opens a door for the Word of God. Pray that God opens a door for ministry. Pray that God would open the mouths of the, of the speakers and the hearts of the listeners as the gospel's being proclaimed. Because the goal in God's will is to redeem man back into himself. And the only way that can happen if man opens his heart and receives the seed of the Word of God and hears the gospel. Pray asking for the Holy Spirit's help. Number two. As it concerns my prayer, but look at verse 5 here. Walk in wisdom toward those that are outside, redeeming the time. As it concerns only my prayer life, but also my daily walk. Because in verse 5, we see that I must walk wisely. You must walk wisely. So not only must we pray for people and for power, but also we must have a responsibility to witness to the lost around us and to seek to bring them inside of God's family. And in, in order to do this, we must first walk in wisdom. This It says walk in wisdom. That means be careful not to say or do anything that would make it difficult to share the gospel with that person. Uh, people watch your actions, watch your reactions if they know you are a Christian. Be alert to the opportunities that God gives us for personal witnessing. Walking in wisdom concerns our conduct in as Christians in, the daily, in our daily life. Because uh, there must be nothing in our lives that would jeopardize our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim in His name as we, we work with Him to expand the kingdom. Now, I'm not saying be perfect because none of us are perfect. I'm saying live your lives with character and with integrity. Be like Christ each and every day, growing in Him. Others will be able to tell if Christ is alive in you or not. Walking in wisdom can also do in our work faithfully. 
paying our bills, keeping our promises, being honest. But walk also opportunistically. As I'm walking wisely, I'm also to be walking, redeeming the time. Ephesians 5.16 also mentions that, meaning I am to buy up every opportunity to live up in light to God's will. This was a commercial term, redeeming the time, and it pictures the Christian as a faithful steward who knows an opportunity when he sees one. Just as a merchant seizes a bargain when he finds one, so a Christian seizes the opportunity to win a soul to Christ. That goes back to Paul's prayer to open doors of opportunity for ministry to be sensitive to his spirit. Also number three, I find in verse six, as it concerns my effective witness, notice this, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each person. As, as far as my witness, my speech, I must speak tempered with grace. You must speak tempered with grace. It's not enough simply to walk wisely and carefully before other believers and others who are outside the church, but when that door of opportunity opens, we must also talk with them and share the gospel message with them. However, we must take care that our speech is controlled by grace so that our speech points to Christ and glorifies Him and not ourselves. Our speech is supposed to minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4.29, we must speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. The person who speaks graciously can do so because he's experienced the grace of God in a personal way. Having experienced this marvelous grace should make a person want to see others also enjoy it. Therefore, gracious speech comes as a result of God's grace being manifested in a Christian. Now this means we must have grace in our hearts. Because it's from the heart that the mouth speaks. Jesus spoke grace on his lips in Luke 4, 22. And even when Christ was dealing with sin, Psalm 45, 2, he spoke words of grace. Also it says, seasoned with salt. Speak, our speech must be seasoned with salt. The attractiveness of one's speech as salt enhances the flavor of what you're eating. Salt in that day uh, prevented immediate spoilage and decay. Our speech should be tempered so as never to be corrupt or obscene. Uh, Ephesians 4.29, to let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the hearers, uh, the use of edifying, and it may minister grace unto the hearers. Salt was added to the Old Testament sacrifices, Leviticus 2.13. Look on your words as sacrifices offered to God, just as our words of praise are spiritual sacrifices, Hebrews 13.15. It would help us to say the right things in the right manner if we remember that our words are looked on as sacrifices to God. But also I'll see this. Season with salt that you may know how to answer each one. I must speak also flavored with humility. We as believers must know how to answer every person. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, but know your worldview, but also be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason of hope. That's apologetics knowing what to say and how to say it. Meekness is the opposite of harshness. Fear is the opposite of arrogance. There's not a place in a Christian conversation for a know-it-all attitude. While we need to have convictions and not compromise, we must also cultivate a gracious spirit of love. We are to be witnesses when asked, not, prosecutor, not prosecuting attorneys picking fights with others. So our, we've looked at three things in, these, in this passage here, my prayer life, my walk, and my witness. Three things in, the, in word and actions others can tell when Christ is preeminent in your heart and your life. In way of application, two principles. Number one, in way of application, words are powerful. Never underestimate the power of speech. Whether oral or written, there is great power in words. The power of speech is a gift from God and it must be used the way that God ordains. The tongue is but a little member in our bodies, but it can accomplish great things for good and for evil. But third, secondly, actions should back up words. The Christian's walk and talk must be in harmony with each other. Nothing will silence the lips like a careless lie. When character, conduct, and conversation are all working together, it makes for a powerful testimony. What would happen if every believer and every Christian, simply by their words and their actions, demonstrated to those that are outside the church that they are Christ followers? having the credibility to help what they say is evidence in their actions.
What an incredible thought I want to share with you tonight. And it just this was laid on my heart. I wanted to do this to where we can finish this study up next Wednesday night. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening tonight. Hope and trust you have a great rest of the week. Lord willing, I'll see you Sunday. Looking forward to a good service that day. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.